people are reaching out to me and saying thank you one of these days i think i need to start giving out your phone number so that people can be calling you directly to to also inquire on some things but many of them were saying thank you for taking off time to educate them and also to share insights which they find very very valuable in terms of uh, accumulating knowledge on land issues so i just had to make sure that i pass that message because i know quite a number of them do listen into the show and it would be very very important for me to deliver that message counsel to you that is very good feedback to hear indeed uh, i am humbled and i'm happy that uh our efforts at least are not in vain if people reach out i have also been contacted by uh, a few other people and uh, like we told you uh, the topics we are having are inspired by the inboxes the phone calls and the concerns that uh, you our listeners always have fantastic so council there is a term called hustler in this country and the term hustler Many people have actually experienced it, especially when they start dealing in land and they find people have already taken advantage of them. They have got into deals they never knew were wrong. They have gotten the wrong elements to sell them wrong stuff. And the hustlers actually have made the street a bit very, very tricky for people dealing in land. So, Council, as we get started today on getting over dubious land deal in Uganda, what are some of the things that the listeners um, to this show should be expecting tonight? Uh, thank you, Yugaman. Unfortunately, in my other world, I like the word hustle. And uh, I like the word hustler, but given the meaning you have given it today and the context, I don't think uh, I would like it. But uh, to me, a hustler is someone who is out there probably not doing one thing or doing too many things, but making sure ends meet. Uh, of course, given the context in which you bring it, uh, many have taken it a step further to do dubious things or fraudulent things as we shall be seeing today. But tonight we shall be looking at uh, what really fraud is. When we talk about fraud or a dubious land deal, what does it mean? And uh, what has the law categorized it to be? We shall see what amounts to it. And then uh, why is it even necessary to talk about fraud? Why should someone prove it? And then after seeing that, we shall see what remedy somebody has if he has fallen prey. And uh, some of the remedies include the caveats or the land titles if it is registered, but shall be looking at the various types and then uh, how to even lodge such caveats. And then uh, some remedies include going to court, which court do we go to? And then uh, if it is a contract for purchase of land, how can it be cancelled? Yeah, that is what you're going to be briefly looking at tonight. And uh, I hope our listeners are uh, really tuned in fantastic thank you council i think that was very very precise so welcome ladies and gentlemen to yet another edition of the amity realtors charts i'm going to be talking to council alan and definitely there will be more people that will come in to comment on the topic and the subject that we're discussing later on um council alan i know today we really don't have much time i know you're a very very busy person tonight so um i would love us to straight away kick into this conversation the beauty is that the conversation is being recorded and i want to remind you ladies and gentlemen this conversation is powered by amity realtors a real estate agency in western uganda now council um first things first what is fraud Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Yugaman. Uh, the definition of fraud that has been adopted by the law and uh, many courts is uh, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, the highest court in the land has uh, defined this in a very old case, not really old, but uh, a very uh, prominent case, something we call locus classicus on fraud. And this is uh, a case of Frederick 
Zahawe versus Orient Bank Limited and uh, others. But uh, in here, uh, the justice of the Supreme Court and uh, the lead judge here was the retired Supreme Court judge and uh, Chief Justice, the Honorable Justice Bart Katulevi, where he says that fraud is an intentional perversion of truth for the purpose of inducing another in reliance upon it to part with some valuable thing belonging to him or to surrender a legal right. Basically, it is anything calculated to deceive whether by a single act or combination or by suppression of truth or suggestion of what is false, whether it is by direct falsehood or innuendo, by speech or silence, word or mouth or look or gesture. It is, it is what we know as the general fraud that we face today and uh, as it is defined in the English terms. But uh, when it comes to land matters, this kind of fraud must be attributed to the transferee. A transferee is someone who has purchased land and has had the certificate of title transferred into their names. It must be attributable either directly or by necessary implication. And then this means that uh, whoever has bought or has had land transferred into their names must be guilty of that of a fraudulent act or must have known of such act by somebody else and taken advantage of such an act. For example, let's say uh, I am aware that uh, the land I am seated on today, uh, plot 57, High Street Mbara is uh, on a lease, but this lease has only one year to expire, or is actually expired. But I go ahead and purport to transfer my lease interest in this plot of land to a one Tony. If Tony is also aware that this lease is actually uh, expired, but agrees to enter into such a contract, then fraud can also be attributed to him and me as well. So that is the nature of fraud. That is what we can call fraud. And uh, fraud must be proved strictly when we go to courts and we are talking. The burden being heavier than on a balance of probabilities generally applied in the civil matters. The moment you allege fraud, it is even a legal requirement that uh, if you're filing a case in court and you say somebody has been fraudulent and uh, you are alleging that something must be cancelled because the transaction was fraudulent, you must state the particulars of fraud. What particulars did they do? Uh, counsel, maybe just to, just to um, <clears throat> get back to that point, Maybe the question that I would want to put straight forward to you so that our listeners now know the answers to that. Why is it necessary, as we talk about today's topic, why is it necessary to prove fraud? Why is it necessary? Why is it important? Okay, uh, thank you, Fred, uh, for the question. It is important for us to prove fraud when we talk about a fraudulent dealing, uh, especially with regard to registered land, simply because under the new law that we have, uh, it is presumed that the registered proprietor of land is the owner of land, unless otherwise proved. And the only unless or the only exception that can defeat a registered title is that particular fraud. Once you can prove it, unless you prove fraud, whoever owns the certificate of title is assumed to be the owner of that certificate of title. So that is why it is very, very important to prove that at least there was a fraud and dealing. These are principles of the law that have been laid down by our court since 1977. And uh, you look at a case of Luanga versus the Register of Titles, where a court has said that once the registered proprietor is established to be a bona fide purchaser of value, that title cannot be impeached or cancelled, notwithstanding that he acquired his or her title from a fraudster. 
and that is the doctrine of bona fide purchaser. So unless you are able to prove fraud, the law protects whoever owns a certificate of title. That is why we have seen today so many people, uh, there is a term now that has come up of absentee landlords. Somebody has a certificate of title and by law, they are the owners of the land. So unless you prove that this certificate of title was obtained fraudulently, either by notice or this fraud can be attributed to some other facts, then that certificate of title unfortunately cannot be cancelled. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're most welcome. I just want to remind you that when you look down on the screen of your phone, on the right hand side, there is a comment section. So if you have any questions, you have any comments you want to make as council is going through this topic, please go ahead and use that comment section. I'm also going to be tagging uh, uh, some tweets that I've made on this, um, you know, conversation as regards our uh, supporters and our uh, brand that empowers us to have this conversation. So, Council, the next thing that I want to ask is, now that you've mentioned why it is important and necessary to prove fraud, what are the available remedies? Just if if someone discovers that, hey, I am I am in a mess, and I I need I need some remedies. What are the available remedies? that someone can easily go to or someone can easily look out for? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate all the listeners that have joined in. But uh, to speak candidly, uh, the remedies of fraud are not very many, but uh, I'll begin with the simplest. Uh, if land is registered and uh, you happen to probably find that uh, your certificate of title or the land you bought is titled and you are not aware, you are not informed of the same. There are people who will come, bring to you, take you, take you to a piece of land and tell you, look, uh, this piece of land is uh, mine. Then you ask them, does it have a title? They'll tell you, no, 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 we don't have a title. And uh, they will go ahead and tell it to you land as though it were customarily held. So the first remedy you have in such instances and many others is to lodge a caveat. Is to lodge a caveat uh, on the certificate of title that you claim interest in. Uh, there are various types of caveats, but uh, you look at uh, Section 159 of the RTA uh, provides for rectification or other properties and certificates in case errors were included in the land titles. So let's say yeah, you've surveyed your land and the title has exceeded and gone into another person's land. That could also be actually a fraudulent act. You are uh, entitled to go ahead and uh, load such a caveat. And then uh, we have instances where there are beneficiaries of an estate, but uh, the registered proprietor of that suit land is deceased. My father died, and unfortunately, we have not yet transferred the land but that land was registered in his names. The best way we can protect our interests. These remedies are available uh, pre and uh, after. So you can lodge a caveat to stop any further dealings in the land. That is, you are going to prevent any other fraudulent dealings that would have come up. And also, if somebody has probably started a fraudulent dealing, you can as well lodge a caveat and have that person stopped or have any other transactions on such a land stopped. Uh, the other remedy that is available is uh, an application to court or you file a suit in court. This is, of course, the most available remedy. Uh, this is available to both registered and uh, non-registered landowners or people facing fraud in uh, such areas of land where it is registered or not registered. And uh, here the question will be, which court do I go to and what do I ask court to do? Uh, the first thing is to know the value of the subject matter of your land and know that a magistrate grade one has jurisdiction not going beyond 20 million and then a chief magistrate will not go beyond 50 million shillings. And if anything goes beyond 50 million shillings, you will file in the high court where that transaction happened or where the suit land is situated. 
So once you know which code to go to, then the next question you're going to ask yourself is, what do I need code to order? Code can give a lot of orders, but you must move code, you must ask for these orders. The first order in case of registered land, glorious be cancellation of that certificate of title if it was fraudulently obtained over somebody else's land. I have my land here. I have never titled it. I've never gotten a title for it, but somebody comes, does its survey, and registers it in their own names. My remedies are very many, but uh, when we say we are going to court, I am going to seek a court order, number one, to have that title cancelled. Okay? But in there, I am alleging fraud. Uh, the other options are, of course, uh, if it is a contract, you can have this contract rescinded. If somebody does not uh, disclose all the facts of the deal, or if midway before you finish paying up, you discover that actually somebody selling to land is not the owner of this piece of land. Uh, so you can uh, write to them or inform them that, look, uh, we entered into a contract, but uh, this kind of contract, I find that you misrepresented. And because you misrepresented a fact, I am not comfortable continuing with this contract. But again, this goes back to the basics that we've been advocating for ever since we started these spaces, and it is a gospel we have been preaching that even in dealing with all these transactions and the remedies that we are talking about, you will need services of a lawyer. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> now, Council, there is also something that maybe we need to deeply um, discuss I know a lot of people start to say, oh, that land has a caveat, that land has a caveat, there's this caveat, there's that caveat. And a lot of us don't even understand the details about caveats or maybe, you know, the different types of caveats that people should be looking out for as we get into these deals to avoid getting to that level where we get frustrated uh, in the process of, you know, looking for development. Now, I, I wanted to ask this question. What are the types of caveats that we need to know first and foremost? And how should someone actually be able to identify if a property or land has a caveat on it? Okay, uh, thank you, Yuga Man. Uh, number one type of caveat uh, you will know I have already talked about is uh, a caveat by the beneficiary. And uh, this is somebody who claims an interest under an estate of a deceased person. Uh, such a caveat, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, once lodged, does not expire. That is according to the law. So if you're beneficiary to any estate and you lodge a caveat on any certificate of title, that caveat is not going to expire until your interests as a beneficiary are fulfilled or until you actually withdraw it all until there is a court order moving that caveat. Otherwise, every other caveat lodged against the proprietor lapses within 60 days. And upon lapse, the registrar is going to be able to give you a notice, you who lodged the caveat, why the same should not be lapsed. Uh, the other type of caveat is uh, a caveat for bidding registration or bringing of land uh, under the Registration of Titles Act. If I have, uh, like I've already told you, my customary piece of land and uh, one Johnny wants to bring this land into his names or under the Registration of Titles Act, but uh, I am somehow informed before a title is signed off, I'll be able to lodge a caveat for bidding the same. And uh, once this is lodged, the registrar of titles cannot proceed and go ahead and uh, register the said land in the person's names. Uh, the other kind of caveat is uh, a caveat by anybody claiming an interest in the suit land uh, or rather in any piece of land. And uh, these interests vary, but here we look at uh, uh, the best example or examples we give uh, usually the matrimonial property where a spouse has an interest in uh, a land and is worried that uh, this land might be probably uh, sold off or taken off by the other spouse. And then 
their interests defeated. This spouse enjoys the right of security of each person. And uh, to, pr to protect this, <clears throat> they are entitled to lodge a caveat uh, that is provided for under Section uh, 86 of the RTA. But this is really general for anybody claiming an interest. That is just one of the interests. But there are other legal instruments that go ahead to create interest by which you can lodge a caveat. You can look at uh, the mortgages. If somebody has mortgaged that land in a bank or a financial institution or to any money lending institution, such institution or lender or mortgagee is entitled to go ahead and uh, lodge a caveat. Uh, it has now been uh, formalized as a registration of a mortgage, but that as well is a caveat. So basically, those are some of the types that we can discuss. Uh, fantastic. Um, Council, I also know that after people know the types of caveats, it's sometimes hard to know if the caveat is still holding or it has already expired. And when does it expire? You know, in case maybe the land has had a caveat for this amount of time, when does it expire? And how should people find out that, you know, the caveat is expired? Uh, thank you, Yugaman. I have noted that uh, a caveat will lapse within 60 days. Those are about three months from the date of lodging the same. And uh, unless uh, at the expiration of these uh, 60 days, you have sufficient notice, uh, notice is going to be given to the caveator uh, that the proprietor has applied to have that caveat removed. And this is what we have always advised people that, uh, yes, you might be knowing uh, the simple remedy of uh, lodging a caveat, and it may look a very simple procedure because uh, the land systems have simplified some of this. But once you have lodged a caveat, do not sit back. Okay? Move on to the next step. Go ahead and have a suit filed. Claim your interest and a declaration of court. So... Most caveats are uh, point 60 days. They are not going to be extended and uh, they will be lapsed upon application of the, of, the proper, of the property registered owner. The other point uh, when caveats might lapse is that uh, I've talked about the beneficiary's caveat. That does not lapse and it will stay forever. But also there are caveats that are put by court, by a court order. These usually have a certain limitation or a certain period of time within which to lapse. Let's say it's an injunction or an interim order. It will probably be registered within 30 days and that will lapse. And uh, in our practice today, and the courts have moved on to not to issue such interim orders that lapse in uh, a period of time, let's say one month, we have now moved on to encourage litigants and uh, the lawyers always make sure if there is a case that is warranting of the court order, you make an application for the temporary injunction because that usually lasts longer, uh, let's say, until the completion of a suit. But you need to note that if a caveat is put by a court order, it can only be removed by a court order. Not consent, not the registrar, nobody can remove a caveat that has been put by a court order. So briefly, that is what I can say about expiry of caveats. Thank you. Uh, Council, I just have uh, something, you know, maybe we need you to supplement on this. So I have seen quite a number of people put a lot of signposts in the land. This land is a family property, not for sale. This land cannot be bought. Do not tamper buying this land. Do, not. Do those things hold any legal meaning? in terms of if 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 i got into something and say maybe um, i'm i'm in court can such a thing stand as as maybe proof that the land had a caveat on it or will you only need uh caveats that have been put by court uh, thank you yugaman uh when we look at uh, the signpost you're referring to uh, for us, when we are defining or proving that actually you had notice that uh, 
such and such a thing existed we shall also allude to those so once you go to a land and they are telling you buyer beware this land is not for sale others have interpreted it to be not for sale but uh, ideally somebody is ringing a bell ringing a bell for you the prospective buyer that look this land you are coming to is not you need to probably dig deeper so yes these are some of what we shall call caveats but uh, usually these are on unregistered pieces of land uh, if a piece of land is registered and there's no caveat on such certificate of title you've done your search at the lands department and you've not seen any encumbrance that prohibits further dealing in that land you are free to go ahead however when you visit locals and find such uh, rather when you visit the land and find such signposts then we shall take that to be notice you have had notice that there is something you have to look out for so in case you proceed and deal with that land then you cannot again go back and say that you are defrauded because you really had notice of everything going on on that land uh great uh, ladies and gentlemen this conversation is powered by amiti realtors and when you check in the conversation we are having above i have pinned a tweet which has a lot of details on the current hottest assets and hottest deals land deals that amiti is having on table so you can click through as you're listening to see what land deal can actually suit your needs or maybe someone you know so council before i go to the next question i have council philp here uh who wants to have an input council philp if you can hear me kindly unmute your mic and uh, go ahead thank you yoga man and thank you alan for the good uh, presentation i just wanted to hit on a few things uh one is that one way of getting over a dubious land deal is first to be informed. You as a person involved in land transaction, you need to have a lot of information about land deals. Uh, maybe what Alan also forgot or what I think is also critical. Uh, in case you, the transaction involves forged documents, uh, some of these forged documents are forged land titles, forged powers of attorney, uh, forged signatures, forged IDs. It is critical that you can also lodge a criminal case against the people involved in that land. Uh, uh, maybe the second one is where a registrar, Alan has also hinted on it, but slightly where a registrar has made two titles over land you apply to, for that land that land title to be cancelled and the third element is to occupy the land uh, in many transactions where i have been involved with alan he always gives it to me as the first remedy i don't know why he has not given it or he could have skipped his mind it is always critical that you actively occupy the land you may not build on it you might fence it you might pour building materials in it uh, that is one way that you can get over a dubious land deal because whenever you occupy land someone else will come up say to claim that it is his that is when you know that the people that have several interests in it uh, maybe let me let me also tell the listeners i have read uh, the police report of 2020 it shows that 300 319 land cases involved fraud and over 4.18 billion was lost in such transactions. So it is critical that the listeners avoid being uh, part of such transactions to lose their money. Uh, I'll not be the speaker of the day, but uh, maybe I'll come in later to, to, to hint on who does fraud or how fraud comes up. Because these are also areas that we forget, but they are red lights that you can easily see and avoid a dubious transaction thank you if given opportunity i'll come back later on that thank definitely you. definitely thank you council for your wonderful input there uh council alan just one minute before i come back to you i have hassan here uh hassan unmute your mic if you can hear me so you can have your input shortly maybe in one minute or two
Hassan, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hassan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the platform. I'm new here. Kata the of Chief. And uh, so far, what you guys have shared is really, really important. And uh, for that reason, I'm here to stay and follow suit. And thank you so much, guys. I'm a, I'm a listener. Hopefully, I'm going to be a good listener. And I'm, I think I'm going to learn much here because I'm new in this thing of real estate. And, uh, Fantastic. Thank having, uh, you. Having Chief on board is going to be so helpful. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, we look forward to having you in the conversation. Uh, so I'm coming back to Council Allen now. Um, now that we know what a caveat is and everything, Council Allen, just I wanted you to take us through how can I lodge a caveat? I have I have this land, maybe I have we, we have some land somewhere. I don't know where to start from. How can I lodge a caveat? on that piece of land or that property? Uh, thank you, Yugaman. Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, but uh, it is as simple as, uh, number one, have an interest in that piece of land. And uh, when you talk of having an interest, uh, you are not just going to allege. You must have evidence to back up your interest in this piece of land. Uh, the best example we've been giving, I bought a piece of land, However, I was not informed that this land is uh, comprised in a registered certificate of title. Uh, tomorrow, probably even before I finish the balance, I have even finished paying. Uh, somebody comes and says, ah, you man, I have a title. You must uh, buy yourself. Okay? That is the common term they use. But uh, you must uh, declare your interest. And uh, so what do you do? Number one, look for that certificate of title. This person is saying uh that their land is comprised in and then uh get the details of that certificate of title let's get the plot number and then the block number the acreage and the location plot numbers and block numbers could be similar but uh, you need to be sure of the location of that particular land once you have found out uh the details then uh look for the nearest emzo or lands office where this title falls we have various land offices. Uh, they have now decentralized. It is no longer the proverbial Waxo and Teve and uh, probably the head office. Uh, in the Western, we have, I think, two Emzos. We have uh, three, actually. We have Fort Koto, Barara, Kavale, but in Kampala, there are many. So you may need to know whether it is uh, at KCCA, Okalasa, or in Waxo. So once you know where this land uh, is, is kept or the land rather the run, land title is registered at, then we'll proceed and uh, file what we call <coughs> applications or land application for a caveat. Uh, this application is going to be uh, accompanied with uh, what we call a statutory declaration. In this, statutory, in this statutory declaration, you are going to detail what your interest is, where you derive your interest. And uh, when you are filing or signing this social declaration, you are going to attach the documents that uh, prove your ownership or your interest in that piece of land. You must take an interest in supplying documents that are coordinated because the moment these documents are not coordinated, your caveat is going to be rejected. And now the commonest error here is that uh, you find that somebody is uh, Msasri Alan, but uh, when he was purchasing land, probably didn't even use his names or use different names. Maybe he's an Alan Biamjisha are the names he used when buying that land. So if you attach an agreement registered in the names of Alan Biamjisha and then you are claiming to be Msasri Alan, such documents are going to be rejected and your caveat, unfortunately, will be rejected. So once you have the certain declaration, then attach passport photos uh, plus a valid national identity card. Uh, these days, they're also requesting for a registered telephone number for contact or ease of contact. And then the most important thing in any caveat is you have to put your address in case of anything. Now, this is the challenge to us. Uh, this is a colonial law that was uh, imported into Uganda. And uh, if I may ask how many on us on call have uh, 
what we call postal codes or post office post box numbers very few so unfortunately it is a requirement of the law that you must set your address even today we don't know some of us where we live you don't know your plot number you don't know your uh, street number so or even if you knew it somebody is serving may not be able to identify it now this is where again uh, you are going to need services of a lawyer because for us as lawyers when uh, opening chambers our addresses are registered and they are not going to change when i change my address i must notify the law council and the law society and all my colleagues because i'll send out an email and that change is going to be noticed by everybody so this is when you need a lawyer to at least give you their address to use it and then guide you further but if you don't put an address of where you stay you the person lodging a caveat this caveat unfortunately is going to be rejected so uh once you have done that you will proceed and uh, get an assessment from the uri website and uh know how much uh, stamp stamp duty and fees you are bound to pay and once you have paid the same you get receipts uh these days we get uh what we call uh, barcodes now uri has intensified of course they are also avoiding fraud because many people were uh, taking fake receipts to land and uh, proving that look we have paid the stamp duty when actually they haven't now uri has moved a step further to say no we shall provide barcodes that you cannot forge uh, so once you have all those then you go ahead and uh, file at the registrar uh, of lands where you identified this particular title to be once you have done that uh, your job first of all is to make sure you have a received stamp of your documents again you will need services of a lawyer who i am telling you now that when you are filing a caveat do not file one document and go away because tomorrow you are not going to have proof that you filed a caveat file a minimum of two sets have a received copy file one copy and have another copy received so once you have done that then you can probably keep checking with the lands if they don't send you an sms or call you then they will get what you call an instrument number you have only successfully lodged a caveat on a registered piece of land if you have received an instrument number it is that instrument number that guarantees protection of your interest so that is in respect of a uh, titled land but in case land is not titled how do we go ahead and lodge caveats i'll give simple examples one uh, we have already talked about the signposts please go ahead and put those signposts in bold go in some expenses and print or have inscriptions on those land on that land have writings on the walls if it is a building and in any case write a letter let your lawyer write a letter to whoever it may concern give copies to the local chairman lc1 give copies to the police and also go ahead and make radio announcements these may be things that you may neglect but trust me you have done what you can okay when you go before the law you are not going to be judged as somebody who just looked on as your land was probably being taken over over to you guys uh thank you council um <clears throat> now council uh, just before I go to the next question, which is very important and I think the most important for this conversation, um, I just wanted to make a brief announcement for those of you that could be looking out for opportunities in real estate. Uh, Amity Realtors is actually having a window for those of you that may want to partner with them in different areas and different uh, aspects of the business. So please do go ahead and follow them. And if you want to also do a partnership with them, please go ahead and reach out to them. They'll be able to get back to you. Now, Council, this question that I'm about to ask is already, I already have like three people who are asking the same question. Um, I now discover that um, actually I have been played. I am into a land deal that is dubious, that is not the right one. Which court do I go to and what steps do I take step by step so that maybe the listeners, and I already have two people who are asking this question, can know where to start from? Okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Yugaman, and uh, to all our listeners, I want to appreciate uh, the presence of uh, our Miss Uganda, Nakakando. I have seen you here. Uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, I appreciate. Uh, I hope you are tuning in and listening in and uh, taking good lessons. Number one, when you think of going to court and uh, getting over that dubious land deal, what to do, the first question is going to be, do you have evidence? Because when you talk about land and going to court, it's not about sentiments. Court is not about sentiments, about feelings, about mood swings, about quiz. Court is all about evidence. So the moment you think of going to court, get out all your documentation. You have your documentation. The next question is, do you have those witnesses? Was your land sale agreement or land purchase agreement actually witnessed? Because if it wasn't witnessed, now that is another challenge. If your land transaction agreement is only between you, the buyer, and the seller, that is quite unfortunate. You have to be sure you have other witnesses, neighbors witnessing that transaction. So once you have the documents, you have your witnesses you are sure of, you can now seek services of a lawyer. And when you come to me, when I look at those documents and witnesses, what I'm going to be looking for is, number one, did you buy the land? How do we prove that you bought land? Because a mere agreement for purchase may not suffice unless you actually have proof that you made a deposit of that money. So in most of our agreements, you will find that uh, we include a clause that says, by endorsing this agreement, this buyer of, uh, rather the vendor of land has received and acknowledges receipt of a deposit that amounts to this. And then the purchaser undertakes to pay the balance at such and such a time. Why we do this? Because the law is very clear. Like we have said, whoever owns a title owns that land. Now, whoever owns a purchase agreement has bought land. And the only remedy, you the vendor, you are entitled to, fortunately or unfortunately, is a claim for the balance of the purchase price. Now, that is something interesting. We can discuss another day, but uh, I can hint on that and stop at that. Uh, when you have the documents, witnesses, and you have paid part of your purchase price, now the question will be, uh, this was a contract for 100 million shillings. I was buying land. I made a deposit of 50 million shillings. But look, I was duped. The subject matter of the land is 100 million shillings. That is automatically the high court. But the question is, which high court? We have now moved on from the proverbial five or seven high court circuits in Uganda, and we have so many high courts. So you have to be sure where is your land located? Where did this transaction take place? Because those are the key elements that are going to determine which high court you go to. If land is in Mubende and you sat in Kampala and made your contract, you may not be able to file your suit in Nakawa or at Kampala Land Division. So you might have to go to Mubende and file where this land was situated. And then having known that, uh, I have already noted that uh, when we talk about which court to go to, we talk about the jurisdiction uh, in two terms, the geographical and pecuniary. When you talk pecuniary, we are talking about the monetary value of the subject matter. This is now we're talking about the land. If the land exceeds 20 million, it is going to go, okay, let's begin with uh, any land that is below 20 million shillings. That is going to go before a magistrate grade one. If the land exceeds 20 million shillings, but does not go beyond 50 million shillings, that is going to go before a, ma a chief magistrate. And if the land exceeds 50 million shillings, that is going to go before a high court. Of course, there are exceptions in there uh, that relate to customary land and all that and all those, but those are the major guiding principles. So once you have those, and then you know that we are in this geographical jurisdiction because each magisterial area has a geographical jurisdiction. Each high court area has a geographical jurisdiction. Then you will be able to know which court to go to. The other point is, what do you seek in court? Hey, looks like council muted uh, the mic. 
Cancel. The mic is muted. Uh, sorry, Yuga man. Uh, I thought I'd done good with the reasons and uh, how to go to court, where to go to court. So we can move on to the next point. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Cancer, I also know that you have another engagement coming up. So please kindly feel free to send me a DM so that I can I can be able to quickly uh, let you go and you, you catch up with the next engagement. But before we let you go, there are some questions here. There is someone who made a comment here and I want to read it right now. Um, but this is... Um, uh, Mr. Kigli, he says, but we have land in Nakawa, uh, where la- where a land with a land title and has been given a caveat, but still there is illegal possession. People go to court, which delays the case until the illegal possessors possess for over five years amidst numerous psychological pressure. How should such be uh, remedied? Thanks. Uh, so I, I don't know, Council, if that question is clear. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, the question is not clear, but uh, when you talk of uh, pos- illegal possession and then a caveat and then a court, that alludes to a lot of facts. I would des- de- definitely need to look at the facts of that case and then ascertain. But uh, one thing I know of is that uh, any land that has been caveated either by court order, this is what we call maintaining the status quo. So somebody could be possessing land and then you are challenging the possession of that land. If you are in court, the court is going to issue an order that is upon application by either party that look, let each party uh, for the meantime until the disposal of this suit maintain the land they are using until we have uh, concluded this matter and given final orders. Uh, Fred, before you bring on the next comment, something important you need to note that uh, as you move to court, as you move to court, uh, seeking orders of cancellation of a title, something very important is that it is only the high court that can cancel a certificate of title. If land is registered under the RTA, it is only the high court that is mandated to cancel the certificate of title. So even if you go to the magistrate's court and it is a land that is below 50 million shillings, the court will only give orders, but you will still have to apply for what we call consequential orders. So uh, usually for avoidance of uh, time wastage and all that, uh, the courts have encouraged uh, a person, even if the land is below the the value of the 50 million shillings that is mandated for the high court, you can sneak in that prayer and say, we are here just for purposes of cancellation of that title. But that is upon still the assessment of a lawyer. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Council, there is another question here from Jackie. Jack says, uh, we've had, we had our title for a very long time and later on when we wanted to get a mortgage from the bank, we discovered that there was another land title that was created on the same piece of land with uh, different owners, but with the same details on the land. How often should someone look out for to find if their title they hold is still valid? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Fred. Uh, About two titles being uh, issued on the same piece of land, uh, first of all, the legal principle is very clear. The first in time prevails. Whichever title was created first will always prevail. So that means that the second one, probably when being created, did not do enough due diligence to find out that there was another title. But in most cases, these are errors that result from uh, uh, use of unscrupulous people, I would say surveyors sometimes, and then sometimes uh, actual fraud. You'll find that this is actually actual fraud, and such fraud is embedded deep within the system because the creation of a certificate of title goes through a lot of steps. By the time you have two certificates of title on the same piece of land, unless if it is an error, it is usually a fraudulent deal. Now, how do you keep up with land and ensure that, uh, number one, uh, somebody does not occupy your land? Uh, The best example and uh, what we shall always encourage you, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Philip Navi, has alluded to it. I have always advised my clients 
that one, occupy your land. Make sure you occupy your land. So if you're occupying your land, anybody except somebody who's really fraudulent, when they come to take coordinates and maybe survey your land to issue a title or to procure a certificate of title, they are going to realize that actually, look, this land is occupied by somebody. Can we look out to that person and have their signatures or their consent? Why are they on this land? Okay. Then secondly, uh, the certificates of titles being issued today have what we call uh, a barcode. You can scan through the certificate of title and look at it and know the details that are there. So you are going to be able to determine a fake title and a title that is not fake. But also, if you are sure or if you ever suspect any dubious dealings in your land that you occupy, never hesitate to file a caveat on your own land. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Um, just in uh, a brief moment, uh, I would love to invite Council Phil to have your remarks shortly before we say goodbye to Council Alan, who has a, uh, a duty just in a few minutes. Uh, Council Phil? Yes, you go, man. Yes, you go, man. I'm on. I'm on. Yeah, yes, Council Philip. I, I was just asking for your uh, supplementary points just before we let Council Alan uh, run off the show. Um, a, any supplementary points that you had wanted to make um, on the topic we, we've had? Uh, not much, because he has. He seems to have uh, covered it all in the areas that you asked him. So what I wanted to contribute is a, is, is an, a funny but engaging item. Uh, I tasked myself to look out for who commits fraud and how they commit fraud. So I want the listeners to be keen. These are some of the people that commit fraud because fraud is a racket. One is land brokers or land dealers. How they commit fraud? sometimes is by selling you selling one plot to more than uh to more than one person uh two lawyers lawyers also engage in fraud say by making uh, agreements well knowing that there's already an occupant on that land or conniving with uh, other dealers to issue fake certificates those include uh, some of the officials of the Ministry of Lands, registrars, uh, valuers also commit fraud by uh, undervaluing the value of land. Surveyors commit fraud by giving wrong coordinates. You've heard of uh, a surveyor that was uh, questioned in one of the, of the Commission of Inquiry on Land by... Uh, the recent Commission of Inquiry on Land, a commissioner who confessed that he had made uh, titles in a lake. Uh, then we have uh, police also connives with uh, the racketeers to commit fraud. How they commit fraud sometimes is by getting uh, certified copies of documents concerning someone's piece of land because they can have that authority. So they get certified copies, they go to the fraudsters and uh, make some titles over the land. Uh, those are some of the areas where fraud is committed and what type of fraud is committed. Uh, the other way uh, land dealers commit fraud is by devaluing the land instantly. For instance, they'll come to you and say, we have an acre of land selling uh, 50 million, but the owner is in urgent need of money, so it can go for 25 million. So that alone is an indicator of how a piece of land that was at 50 million can quickly devalue to, uh, to, to 25 million. So that is a red flag that you need to look out for. And maybe lastly, uh, where land can be committed. I mean, okay, the last people who do, the last person was uh, administrators. Administrators of estates can commit fraud by dealing in land without consent of all the other people that are beneficiaries or administrators of that estate. Uh, land can be committed on titled land, 
uh, like Alan has been explaining, land that has certificates of title, land can be committed on official estates. For instance, uh, the most common estate is the estate of the Kabaka. Uh, land can be committed on on that estate by uh, by conniving with he, some of his men, because uh, land of an official estate requires the consent of that landlord. You need the consent of the Kabaka. So sometimes people come up with uh, fake consents or forged consents without the express permission of the Kabaka to, pro, to, to co transact on that land. Uh, the other one is double plotting, which someone has already asked about, where you have two titles on a land, on a piece of land, that is double plotting. Uh, for instance, you cannot have block 11, plot 22, and plot 32. You get it, you have block 11, which has uh, double plots on that piece of land. So those are some of the instances of fraud that are common that people should look out for, more so our listeners. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. I think actually that was a very, very uh, strong input. I don't know if Council Alan has something to supplement on that. Um, I really love the fact when you said the owner has issues, so the land that was going for 100 million, you can give us 40. Ah, a lot of those deals in Kampala are causing mayhem every single day. So, Council um, Alan, do you have something to say on what Council Phil just supplemented? Uh, thank you, Mr. Fred. As I leave, uh, because of my earlier engagement I'd informed you about, uh, my parting shots. Thank you very much, uh, my land friend, Mr. Philip Munavi, for those uh, wonderful insights. And uh, as the topic was, how do you get over the dubious land deal? And uh, my legal perspective is one, as you enter into any land deal, because you will never know which of the which will be dubious, have a lawyer. When I say have a lawyer, I do not mean that if you are a vendor and the purchaser comes with their lawyer, then you are comfortable. No, the law has moved on actually. It is no longer fancy or actually legally permissible to say, uh, for a lawyer to represent the vendor and at the same time represent somebody who is buying land. So let us have two different professional advisors doing advice for either parties getting into a deal of a land because council has told you even lawyers commit fraud. So do not be quick to trust the lawyer of the vendor or the purchaser if you are the other party. And then secondly, double check your facts. Every time you are buying a piece of land, double check. If you have done a search on a piece of land a week ago, before you make the final payment, that is after one week you did the search or one month, go back and do a search, okay? If you're buying land that is not titled, do not hesitate to look for the area chairperson LC1. If you have seen the LC1, what Council Philip has, has uh, not alluded to, they are also agents of fraud. Do not hesitate to look for another person on the committee of the local council one. So uh, once you've done that, and then uh, uh, have a second opinion uh, of any professional. Uh, if it is a surveyor who has done coordinates, do not hesitate to have a second surveyor to confirm. Because what we are talking about is land that involves usually huge amounts of money. People have saved, have given up their life savings to buy a particular piece of land. It is probably prime land, and you really want to be sure. And then lastly, you really want to get over a dubious deal or a dubious land deal, make sure you occupy that piece of land that you have bought. However small, however big, do occupation. However minimal the occupation is, let everybody around that piece of land know that you are the owner of that piece of land. Because before we know it, a squatter who is going to purport to be your employee will begin claiming that land and will begin selling it. Uh, this goes out to my colleagues and our friends in the diaspora who keep sending money and you're actually not on ground. People keep buying for you pieces of land. Once in a while, visit when you come to Uganda, do not spend all your time in the towns and uh, uh, doing other things, but go actually visit that land that you bought or somebody bought for you and have the neighbors get to know that it is you who owns that land. Uh, from me uh, to the listeners and Yuga man, thank you very much and to Amity, Thanks once again for always hosting me. Uh, good night for now. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Kanso. Thank you very much for the insights that you have shared. Thank you to our sponsors, Amite Realtors. You guys have given me the coffee for now two and a half years to always make sure that I'm sober when we're doing these shows. Uh, it's very, very amazing. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring this conversation to a close. Thank you very much. I see the area president is attending and so many other people here. One thing I encourage you guys to do is please follow each other. Follow each other and make sure that you get support from one another. Many of us know friends that are struggling with these issues and yet we we can be able to help them find hope by sending them to people that understand the issues on land matters. But also, do me a favor, move to Amity and buy a plot. That will empower me more to be bringing you this show every single Tuesday for the rest of this year. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll catch you guys again next Tuesday, same time, same place. If you want to catch up with the previous shows that we've done, check out Amity Realtors YouTube. You'll be able to have all all the conversations that we have done. So thank you. And thank you, Council Alan. Thank you, Council Phil. Everybody that has asked a question tonight, allow me go and enjoy my birthday tonight. Um, and I'm so glad that you guys have been sending me all the messages. Thank you very much. And I'm so grateful to God for having brought me this far. So I'll catch you guys again next Tuesday. Cheers. Get better, not bitter.